today I will be talking to you about the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program, or as we call it, the COJG program. So we'll begin. Um, so the purpose of this webinar is so that I can provide an overview of what the Canadian, uh, the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program is to employers or employees who are interested in um, explaining their pro this program to their employers. So what we'll be going over is the program description, the program eligibility, as well as program delivery. So the Canada Ontario Job Grant provides financial support to individual employers who wish to purchase training for their workforce. So employers choose the employees that they would like to have trained, as well as the training that meets their uh, workforce needs. So this program is delivered through a cost sharing agreement between the individual employers as well as the uh, government of Ontario. And then it's divided between large employers as well as small employers. So for large employers, these would be employers that categorize as having 100 or more employees. If a large employer makes a request for the COJG program, um, they would be able to receive at least a uh, half uh, f half of the direct cost of funding uh, of the training costs, whereas for small employers with less than 100 employees, they have a bit more flexibility when it comes to the cost of training. They're only expected to contribute one sixth of the eligible training costs. So as uh, previously mentioned, when it comes to large employees with 100 more employees, the government will cover half the price of the direct training cost up to $10,000 per trainee. Um, as for small employers, so less than 100, as mentioned before, who are training and hiring uh, unemployed individuals may be eligible for 100% funding and up to 15,000 per trainee. So for employers who are looking to hire someone on and they know um, that they need to have like the additional training as well and they could be valid for a COJG uh, grant application, it's really in their favor to do so just because they're able to receive even more funding because it encourages employers to hire unemployed individuals, which obviously is what the Ministry of Ontario is looking for. So then uh, applications that are submitted with uh, the quotation's new hiree, uh, trainees will be automatically assessed for 100% funding. Um, and then when it comes to training your employees, you may require additional material to help them receive the proper training and the government will help cover some of that funding as well, uh, whether it be textbooks, software or other training materials, the government is willing to pay a maximum support of $500 per trainee for the additional textbook, software, or other training material needed to complete uh, whatever training they're doing. And then uh, travel costs may also be covered for employees. So same thing, maximum travel cost is $500 per trainee. As long as the distance that's traveled for the trainee is greater than 24 kilometers each way. Um, I would also note that employers are responsible for the cost of training that falls under the employer financial contribute, uh, contribution. So employers cannot ask their trainees to cover any of the training costs. If an employer is interested in participating in the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program, they must pay all of the training towards the training provider. And you can't expect their employees to pay any part of it and then just tell them after, oh, don't worry, we'll pay you back or anything like that. Um, that would be a no-go. And then if that were to happen, it would not be approved for the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program. Moving on. So um, now I'll explain to you the do's and don'ts when it comes to being eligible for the Canada Ontario Job Grant as an employer. Um, to be eligible, you must meet the following criteria listed below. So an employer must contribute a minimum of half of the eligible training costs in cash, uh, unless you are a smaller employer with fewer than 100 employees. So that section here would only apply to larger employees. Um, to be eligible, you have to employ the individuals that you selected for training. So as I mentioned before, when it comes to smaller um, employers, for example, if you were to hire someone on to participate in the training, once they complete the training, you have to obviously agree to hire them on because for the Ministry of Ontario, it wouldn't make any sense for them to cover the cost of the training if the person at the end of it isn't even guaranteed employment. Um, the employer has to be licensed to operate in Ontario. The employer has to be applying for training that is delivered in Ontario and is related to a job that is also located inside of Ontario. 
uh, just because it is done through the Ministry of Ontario. So what they want to do is all the money that they put in towards this program, they want it to stay within the province as well. Um, the employer must comply with the Occupational Health and Safety Act and the Employment Standards Act as well. The employer must maintain appropriate workplace safety and insurance board or private workplace safety insurance coverage. Um, the employer must have adequate third party liability insurance by its insurance broker. As well, employers must also comply with all applicable federal and provincial human rights legislations, regulations, and any other re relevant standards. Now, this is a list of the don'ts when it comes to the program eligibility. Um, so first off, if the employer is a federal, provincial, or municipal government and or agency, they would not be eligible to receive the COGG funding. If the employer is a broader public sector organization as defined by the, broad, uh, the broader public sector accountability act, they would not be eligible. Um, if the employer is a Canada Ontario job grant service provider, they would not be eligible. So for example, our employment center, Lecce Employment Services, is considered a service provider of the Canada Ontario job grant program. So if ever we had a training that we want to do for some of our employees, we would not be eligible for the program. Uh, the employer cannot be currently in receipt of other government funds related to the same skills training for the same individual. So if they had already requested funds from, let's say, the YMCA, they can't be requesting the same funds from us as well. Um, the employers cannot use the training participants to displace existing staff or replace staff who are on layoff. So same thing, if you have an employee that is on maternity leave or if you have an employee that you have the intentions of firing, you can't get this additional training for your new employee just to get rid of someone else. Um, employers cannot apply for Canada Ontario job grant funding if the training is already started. Uh, this is another important step when it comes to employers that want to apply for this program. It has to be done quite in advance to when the actual training date starts because we do have a, quite a large amount of paperwork we have to collect from the employers, uh, the participants, as well as the training providers. So earlier is always better just so we can get all our eggs in our baskets. Um, Again, as I mentioned before, employers cannot compel participants to pay any part of the employer's uh, Canada Ontario job grant contribu a contribution related to training either directly or indirectly. So again, the employer has to contribute, uh, the employer's contribution is the employer's alone. Um, and then employers meeting basic eligibility requirements outlined above are not guaranteed funding. Uh, the ministry and or service providers will apply value for money and tier assessment criteria in the ranking and approval of employer applications according to budget availability and the program strategic priorities. So even if an employer meets all of the do's and doesn't meet any of the don'ts in the list, sometimes they might not always be accepted uh, for different reasons. So for example, we had a person that requested uh, for training for their employees and they met all the criteria, but one of the problems was that it was done online and the training provider was located in the States. So because it is located outside of Ontario, that's one of the reasons it wasn't accepted. And same thing when it comes to budget availability, if we're close to the end of our fiscal year, and let's say we only have maybe $5,000 left in our funds and someone requests a COJG grant for $10,000, for example, we wouldn't be able to accept it because of the lack of funds. But what we would be able to do would be refer them to another uh, COJG service provider that would have the additional funds. So that's one thing we tend to do with other employment agencies or service providers in the area. We'll transfer applications to each other back and forth just to make sure we're able to facilitate all the employer's applications as much as possible. So then uh, when it comes to the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program, some employers can be deemed to not be eligible for future applications. And these would be the reasons why. Uh, the employer did not follow through on anticipated action post-training as outlined in the application, such as increasing the trainee's wages or hiring an unemployed new hire, except under uh, exceptional circumstances. So this would only apply, for example, if the participant completed the training but did not pass the exam, which is a requirement for the job. So in that case, um, if the employee went through all of the training, but obviously wasn't hired on after, just because they didn't pass the um, exam at the end, that's a different situation. Uh, another reason they wouldn't be eligible anymore is if the employer did not submit required documentation that is required by the ministry. 
Um, another reason would be the participants did not complete the training and the employer failed to inform the service provider or the ministry. As a result, the ministry was still required to pay for the training. Um, the employer had been approved for multiple grants in the past, but withdrew uh, or did not follow through on training. The ministry's quality assurance processes, audits, surveys, and another means of verif verifying information on previous applications revealed that the information provided to the min ministry is inaccurate, untrue, or incorrect, which would be another big problem. Um, an employer that is a corporation or other entity may be in ineligible if there is evidence found of abuse of the Canada Ontario job grant funding in the past, or if the controlling parties or corporations or entity were found by the ministry to have abused the uh, COJG funding in the past. And then finally, if the employer has still funds owing to the ministry. So this would just be a list that if ever um, we had an employer that broke any of these rules, they would be deemed uh, ineligible to apply for further Canada Ontario job grant until uh, proven otherwise. So then when it comes to the eligibility uh, for individuals, so this is the list of criteria for participants who want to be considered eligible to participate in the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program. So this would be if you are the employer, for example, this is how you would find out uh, the people that I want to train, are they the right fit for this training? Um, so all people who are residents of Ontario and either a Canadian citizen, permanent resident or protected person and meet the eligibility requirements below are eligible to participate in the training funded through the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program. So employed individuals must be identified by their employer. Um, unemployed individuals must also be sponsored by an employer, sorry, demonstrated through a permanent or conditional offer, offer of employment. So if ever you had the intentions of hiring an employee, but you weren't gonna hire them until they're done their training, you would have to have them sign a conditional offer of an em employment once the training, the COJG uh, training is completed. So an individual may not, must not be participating in full-time training or education or any other government training interventions that offers uh, funding support or uh, for tuition books or other training related costs at the same time that they're signed up for the COJG program. Um, Again, majority, majority shareholders are not eligible to participate in the training funded through the COJG. Um, and then only employers can apply for the COJG program. Individual participants cannot apply. So if you had an employee, obviously, that found out about the COJG program before the employer even knew what it was, um, they would be able to mention it to their employers. But a single participant or individual who is not a shareholder or a stakeholder within the company is not able to apply for uh, the COJG program. Moving on. So again, uh, now we'll go through the actual training eligibilities. Uh, so training supported through the grant is driven by employer demand and must be directly related to the skills needs identified by the employer. So employers identify the types of trainings required to meet their skill needs and the individuals who will be trained. So these are the following types of trainings that are in, ineligible for COJG funding. So the ministry will not provide funding for training that the employer must provide according to the law. Um, business owners, including individuals of a controlling interest in corporations, are not eligible as trainees. So if you're the business owner, um, you would not be able to sign yourself up for, let's say, um, like first aid training with your employees. Um, senior management within large organizations. So large organizations are categorized as over 500 employees. Uh, they would not be, senior management within those companies would not be eligible for COJG funding as well. Uh, senior management at small and medium employers, less than 500 employees, they're still deemed eligible for COJG funding. Um, senior management positions are defined by the 2016 National Occupation Code or the NOC. Uh, they're positions that start with the zero, zero, zero uh, occupations. They're ineligible as well. Uh, other ineligible training programs are executive training courses, uh, preparatory training courses, business consulting services, as well as attending conferences. 
uh, also membership fees, subscription fees, annual fees, professional association fees, they're all ineligible for the COJG funding. So then when it comes to the COJG funding, when you're choosing your training provider and then choosing as well the type of training that you want to get done, um, it cannot exceed one year in duration. It can go up to 51 weeks, but it cannot exceed obviously the 52 week period. Um, it must occur in Ontario or must be delivered online and must be provided by one of the following third party providers. So for it to be deemed admissible, it has to be provided by either a college of applied arts and technology, uh, a publicly assisted university, a publicly assisted uh, indigenous institute, school board, private trainers operating in compliance with the Private Career Colleges Act of 2005, uh, union-based training centers, and then uh, on the next slide, I'll go through uh, eligible product vendors. So when it comes to product vendor training, for the purpose of the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program, product vendor training is defined as any application where the vendor is involved in the creation slash sale of the product and is also conducting the training and how to use that specific product. So the term product uh, refers to business related materials purchased by the employers. So product vendors are not eligible to deliver training on how to use the products or service. Uh, product vendors are only eligible to deliver training that is unrelated to the use of the product or service. So now I'll go through uh, business consulting services as well. So within the Canada Ontario Job Grant funding, uh, business consulting services are not eligible either through the Canada Ontario Job Grant funding. Business consulting services are defined as any situation where the proposed training would consist of a review of the business or organization rather than the development or improvement of skills for training participants. So I'll give you guys an example. If the proposed training consists of increasing an employer's productivity and making their operations more efficient, this training would be considered business consulting and uneligible for the COJG funding. So the whole point of the COJG funding is obviously to improve the employees' uh, work, capa uh, work capabilities as well as their knowledge of their work environment. So if you hire uh, someone to do your business consulting through the COJG program and all they do is maybe it helps your productivity within your company or it helps uh, your operations or your efficiency, but it doesn't provide anything for your employees directly that would result in either an increase in wages or an increase in hours of work it wouldn't be deemed admissible. Moving on. So then uh, we'll now go over the attestation process when it comes to the COJG program. So in cases where employers have selected a private training provider as their first choice, both parties, employers and private training providers will be required to sign an attestation form. Uh, by signing this form, the employer as well as the tra training provider must attest to the following. So I'll just list off everything. Um, the employer has to attest to the eligibility of the training provider. Uh, there has to be no conflict of interest between the employer as well as the training provider. Um, any conflict of interest must be disclosed beforehand. Uh, selected training is not product vendor training. Uh, selected training is not part of business consulting. And then receipt and understanding of the Canada Ontario Job Grant employer and training provider information sheet. And then same thing when it comes to the training providers, it's about the same thing as the uh, employers when it comes to the attestation form. So they have to meet the educational and experience requirements, uh, the length of time providing training, no conflict of interest between the employer and training provider, uh, any conflict has to be disclosed, not, uh, not being an ineligible product vendor, not offering business consulting, and then same thing when it comes to receipt and understanding of the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program. Um, so pretty much the attestation form will be accompanied with the COJG employer and training provider information sheet that'll outline the details of the requirements that employers and training providers are being requested to attest to in their respective attestation forms. Um, employers and or training providers that refuse to sign the attestation forms or have been found to have provided false or misleading information will not be granted uh, the COJG funding. So the main part of the attestation form is just, just make the employer as well as the training provider understand that when it comes to requesting funds from the Ministry of Ontario, they have to agree to as well to disclose um, 
information that us, the service providers, or the Ministry of Ontario directly would need to assess if the funding would be deemed eligible or not. So it's just agreeing that all the information that we need from them or that we request from them, it has to be provided uh, back to us. Moving on. Now I'm just going to go over uh, when it comes to the employer's financial contribution. Uh, it is dependent, obviously, on the amount of employees currently employed. As I mentioned before, it's divided in two sections when it comes to um, employers that have fewer than 100 employees and then more than 100 employees. So as mentioned before, the government covers half of the direct training costs for large employers, 100 or more employees, and then five sixes for small employers, uh, fewer than 100 employees. And again, it's up to $10,000 per trainee. Um, employers may qualify for up to $15,000 per trainee if you are a small employer uh, and are hiring training and um, unemployed uh, candidates. So just give you an example, when it comes to large employers, if they have a training that they're interested in doing and it comes out to a $1,000 cost, the employer only ends up paying $500 of that $1,000 cost. And then same thing for smaller employees. If the training is $6,000, the employer only ends up paying $1,000 out of that $6,000. Moving on. And then, uh, so the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program is delivered through three different streams and uh, I'll review them now for you. So the first stream is training requests for up to 25 participants or also called 25 and under. Uh, the second stream is training requests for more than 25 participants, also called over 25. And then lastly, the third stream is training requests for a group of two or more employers, also called a consortium. So when it comes to consortium, it would be if you had um, two or three local employers that all three of them were interested in doing a specific type of training, let's say it's like first aid for their employees, they could all request the COJG funding at the same time instead of doing it individually, and then it would be considered a consortium instead of doing uh, three different requests for 25 and under. Um, the program activities for each stream is the same, but the manner in which they're delivered is different. Um, for the 25 and under, uh, the ministry will contact with service providers to deliver the program to employers. Um, so, for example, if a request is brought to us that's uh, through the ministry, that's a 25 and under, they would contact the service providers such as Lackley Employment Services to handle the case and then to be the in-between between the Ministry of Ontario as well as the um, employer and the training provider. But then when it comes to the over 25 stream, as well as the consortium stream, the ministry will deliver the program directly to employers. And uh, sometimes they will contact with specific service providers to carry out administrative case management tasks. So this could be uh, doing the follow-ups or uh, checking in once the training is completed or even participating in uh, some of the training classes just to confirm that the funding that was given to the employer is actually put towards the specific training that they had mentioned beforehand. So the consortium stream allows employers to pool the resources together in the pursuit of training solutions that address common workforce skills needs. So for the purpose of the Canada Ontario Job Grant, an employer consortium is a specific group of two or more employers. Each employer within the consortium must be eligible for COJG funding. So same as I mentioned before, um, when it comes to an employer consortium application, even if one of the two employers who applies is considered eligible. At the sec if the second one isn't, the first one won't be deemed acceptable either. So you have to make sure that all parties are deemed uh, eligible before obviously making your employer consortium application. Um, an intermediary organization will serve as the lead applicant on behalf of the employers. So if approved, the intermediary would be the holder of the legal agreement with the ministry and would be accountable for all activities and outcomes. And then most organizations acting as an intermediary are eligible for administrative funding as well, equal to about 15% of the government contribution. Um, training providers may serve in the role of an intermediary in instances where they may also be developing and or delivering the training. 
However, due to the risks associated um, with real or perceived conflict of interest, training providers are not eligible for the 15% administrative funding. So by that, what they mean is if you had, um, let's say, three or four different employers that were app applying for the employer consortium together, if one of the employer decides to take the lead on it and be in charge of uh, being the main contact for the Ministry of Ontario, for example, they could be eligible to receive uh, 15% administrative funding from the government's contribution. But if the training provider is the one that's deemed the intermediary, they wouldn't be eligible to receive the 15% because of a conflict of interest. All right. So then now I'll break down the steps an employer must go through when it comes to submitting an application form for the Canada Ontario job grant funding. So an employer must view, complete and submit, sorry, must view, complete and submit the application form online. Uh, applications are reviewed on a continual basis. For training requests involving 25 or less participants, employers submit the form to a Canada Ontario job grant service provider, which is self-selected. So as mentioned beforehand, uh, Lechley would be an example of a uh, what would qualify as a service provider. Uh, when it comes to training requests involving more than 25 part, uh, training participants and applications submitted by consortia, uh, those forms are submitted to the ministry regional offices based on the location of the training. And then employers consortia requesting training for over 25 participants must also, uh, must also complete an electronic funds transfer form. So when it comes to uh, the employers that or the consortia forms with over 25 participants, a payment has to be made beforehand. But when it comes to smaller um, applications, 25 or less employee uh, participants, sorry, training participants, it has it doesn't have to be done. Um, and then employers need to submit their COJG application, as mentioned before, prior to the start of training, just because if they send in their application, let's say a week before the training begins, it's almost impossible to collect all the correct paperwork, have everything in line before the training begins, and then having to explain to the ministry why we weren't able to have everything in time just complicates everything. So it's best, even if you're able to get your application out, maybe close to a month before the training actually starts, it just makes our lives easier and it makes your lives easier as well. Um, as well, the employer should allow a minimum of 12 business days for the application to be processed. Okay, moving on. And then uh, I'll go through right now the application assessment criteria. So each application received for funding under the COJG program is individually assessed to determine eligibility. So each application must meet all of the eligibility requirements to be considered for funding. Um, it is important to note that meeting all eligibility requirements does not necessarily guarantee funding for the application. So even if you do meet all of the criteria, you get all of the do's and none of the don'ts, it doesn't always mean that you're gonna be accepted through the program. These are just the guidelines that they ask the employers to follow, but all applications are uh, reviewed individually just to go through all of the necessary information in that time and date. Um, so Canada Ontario job grant applications are assessed by the ministry staff and service providers to ensure the validity of applications and training, as well as funding decisions uh, provide value for money and in line with the ministry's priorities. And then when it comes to the Canada Ontario job grant assessment tool, um, the, Canada Ontario, the Canada Ontario job grant applications are sorted into three different sections of tiers to ensure that funded applications are in line with ministry strategic priorities. So they have them divided into tier one, tier two, and then tier three. So the ministry wants uh, service providers as well as um, employers to try and focus more on tier one applications compared to tier two and tier three, just because they're more admissible to be accepted. So I'll go through the definitions of all the different tiers. A tier one is defined as any training which will result in a new job or better job. This includes uh, retaining employees who, are, who have received a formal notice of layoff and is the first approved application for the employer in the last six months. So when it comes to tier one, for example, this would be a training where the employees at the end would either receive an increase in wages, they would receive an increase in hours of work, or they would receive a type of certification or qualification 
that could be used um, with another organization or with another employer if ever they decided to change career paths. So then a tier two is defined as any training that'll lead to a new or better job, but the employer has had an approved Canada Ontario job grant application in the past six months, or the incumbent employee will not receive an increase in wages or change in positions. So same thing, uh, tier two, it would be kind of the same idea as a tier one. It's just, it wouldn't be an increase in wages or a change in position, but uh, as well as there's, if there's still a certificate or a qualification that they ended up uh, receiving that could be used within another organization uh, that would, could be deemed as a tier two as well. And then, Let's see. Uh, tier two applications will only be funded if there is funding remaining after tier one applications are funded. So if we receive, let's say, um, applications for two tier ones and one tier two, we wouldn't um, even look or we wouldn't even put the funding towards the tier two until we're able to establish that we're able to fund tier one training beforehand. Um, Tier three training, on the other hand, is defined as an application that supports employees with the training cost per trainee being below $500 and uh, under one week in duration, or the employer is required to have the training due to legislation, regulations, or policies. Um, for applicants in tier three, consideration will only be given if there are no pending applications in either tier one or tier two, and there's availability in the Canada Ontario job grant budget. So same thing, um, the main priority goes to the tier one, and then if there's any funds left over, it goes to tier two, and then once tier one and tier two are met, then we can start funding for tier three. So then when it comes to the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program, it is the employers as well as the training providers responsibility to answer the messages and complete the forms that are sent to them by the training providers, uh, by the service providers, sorry. Um, employers need to ensure that all forms are filled out correctly and submitted to the appropriate office. So some of these forms would be the employer application form. So this would be your original form when it comes to making an application for the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program. Uh, it would be the training provider attestation form. So as I mentioned beforehand, it's the form that the training provider has to sign on to that they agree to disclose the information that's needed by the Ministry of Ontario as well as the service providers. Same thing for the employers with their attestation form that's required to be filled out. Um, a participant registration form is needed to be filled out as well. So again, same thing. This is a form that would be used um, when it comes to just getting us the chance to contact the uh, participants if, if ever need be during the training or after the training, just to get their point of view of it. Did you find the training was beneficial? Did you find it helped you with your employment? Uh, did you see an increase in wages? Just so we're able to contact the person as well. Um, another one would be obviously the employer registration form. So this would be for us to be able to register the employer within our system as well. And then as mentioned beforehand for uh, COJG applications with over 25 participants or a consortia application, do would need to be an electronic funds transfer form filled out as well. And then employers are responsible to pay the training provider the full amount of the training and will be reimbursed by the service provider or the ministry after. So the employers can receive up to 70% of the reimbursement of funding upon presentation of proof of payment to the training provider. So if you sent in your application for the Canada Ontario job grant, uh, let's say at the beginning of the month, and then it was deemed approved and you send us proof of payment, uh, you would be eligible to receive up to 70% of your reimbursement at the beginning of your training, but the employers uh, receive the remaining reimbursement following the completion of the training and the submission of the completed training outcome report. So essentially how it would work is you would receive 70% of your reimbursement uh, up to 70%, and then the rate remaining would only be reimbursed once we receive or the ministry receives proof of either a certificate of completion or proof that the training was completed and that all participants pass and complete the training. Okay. All right, so I just want to take the time to thank you all for participating to our webinar today. Um, 
If ever you request further information and or details about the Canada Ontario Job Grant Program, please feel free to contact us. Uh, our phone number is 705-549-5227. Uh, if you have any in inquiries through email, our email is cre at lacle.ca or uh, CRE at lacle.ca. Um, you're also able to find information about the COJG program, as well as a link to show you the COJG guidelines on our website, uh, which is lacle.ca slash uh, emploi slash, uh, no, sorry, dash formation slash English. Um, I should note as well that requests involving more than 25 training participants or a consortium will be redirected to the Ministry of Labor Training and Skills Development. So if ever you do have an application that has 25 or more uh, participants, it wouldn't be directed directly to us. It would be sent to the Ministry of Labor. And then if ever they do feel they need our assistance, then it would be sent back to us. So if ever that does happen, we wouldn't be the people that you would be contacting with directly.